You're listening to How to Win Friends and Save the Republic, a podcast from the National Association of Nonpartisan Reformers. I'm your host, Andy Moore. My guest today is Michael Massioni. Michael is a writer, futurist, and conference producer focused on digital media, technology, and innovation. His most recent book, entitled Reinventing Government Through Political Entrepreneurship and Exponential Innovation, discusses programs and strategies of various nonpartisan policy organizations and think tanks. He holds an undergraduate degree in English and a master's degree in management. Welcome to the show, Michael. Good to be with you. Uh, before we kind of get into the book, I you know like to start each episode by learning a little bit about our guest and and really how you come to well in your case to write about this topic. I know your career path is notably different than many of our other guests who are what we refer to as professional practitioners of electoral reform. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your childhood, where you grew up, where, you know, were your parents politically active, those kinds of things? Uh, sure. Uh, well, I grew up in in Long Island, um, and you know, went to high school there, and uh, uh, you know, actually, then you know, in my mid twenties, I moved to uh, New York City. Um, as you mentioned, um, you know, I have a BA in English um, from St. Lawrence University, but my original major was government, uh, so I had a strong interest in politics and government um, from an early age. Uh, and then, you know, I went to graduate school um, in technology management at the Polytechnic Institute of New York, and, and that, you know, brought me more into, um, you know, the, the whole area of marketing research, um, strategic planning, technology forecasting, applied to communications and other um, sectors of technology. Uh, so that's kind of just a very brief background, um, you know, on me. Sure. Yeah. Well, that's. Uh, I think it's really interesting. And I, one of the things that we really like to highlight on how to win friends and save the republic is is the diversity of backgrounds that people have that come into this work. Uh, many people, myself included, did not necessarily, you know, begin with a background in in political science or kind of even grow up in a in a politically active home. But along the way, right? As I think all of us know, our lives are impacted by by politics, by policy, um, by those forces that shape the way that our states or our governments or our cities are run. And for many people in the electoral reform movement, we realize at some point that these systems that we were born into might not be the best solution, right? There may be other options out there or other ways of, of configuring and running a government that would be advantageous in many ways, right? Better representation, uh, more proportional, more reflective of the the population itself. Uh, and so hearing your background, I think, helps kind of shine a light on, well, really like the, the kind of technical side. And, and obviously there's, a, there's an element of communications and marketing that is heavily present in politics. So um, let's talk about your book. Uh, you, I, I got an advanced copy. Thank you so much for sending that to me. Uh, and found it really interesting. Uh, I did appreciate the uh, shout out to Nanner in the book. Um, so again, it's it's called uh, Reinventing Government Through Political Entrepreneurship and Exponential Innovation. And and just to kind of give listeners a, a very top level overview, the, the book as I, you know, kind of experienced it really charts a path that begins with the rise of political entrepreneurship and innovation that we're kind of seeing right now, this nonpartisan nonprofit movement, and then connects to topics down potentially down the road, right? Like civic hacking, gamification, internet voting, the role of robots in government, even um, ideas about borderless governments in, uh, in what you phrase as space nations. Now, I know some of these are you know, pretty out there topics that I would imagine most of our listeners have not even thought about. And I think that's part of the value of the book, right, is that it forces readers to think about things that they might not have considered yet, but perhaps they should. So maybe if we could start with some framing about, maybe tell us a little bit about why you wrote this book and what you hope readers take from it. Absolutely. And I think you, you gave a, a great perspective on the book and, and you know, outlined sort of the scope of, of the book, which covers a lot of different topics. 
uh, you know, things that are more currently relevant as well as more spe- speculative topics like virtual nations and uh, topics of that sort. So I think the impetus for, for this book came about from the fact that I happen to be an independent. I'm not a Republican or Democrat, though. I kind of lean center right. And like so many people in the United States and around the world, uh, I found myself, I've found myself very dissatisfied with the choices um, in major parties, you know, at least in the U.S., Republicans and Democrats, and felt like, you know, there weren't really many candidates that, you know, I felt keen on supporting. Um, and I was aware of a number of, you know, uh, nonpartisan groups like No Labels um, and, and uh, you know, alternative parties. But many, as you know, many third parties have floundered and haven't had sufficient uh, support, financial support, um, you know, backing from major political figures and, you know, major, you know, let's say, alternative political organizations um, that have some standing. Uh, and, you know, I, I just felt like it was important to kind of present a more hopeful look and an alternative look at political innovation and, you know, political alternatives, both in the U.S. and abroad. And then the other aspect of the book was trying to look at how new technologies, uh, new uh, innovation strategies could be applied or adapted to the political and, and governmental worlds. Uh, and that's where all of these different um, strategies and models that you mentioned, such as gamification, crowdsourcing, civic hacking, agile innovation, rapid experimentation, many of these, you know, strategies and tools that are commonly used in the business and technology sectors have started to be used to some degree and, and, and to a greater degree in certain nations and less in others um, in, in government and, and politics. Uh, so that was really, you know, that was a big part of the impetus for the book. Uh, and as part of that, sort of the exponential innovation part of it deals with the use of um, exponential technologies like AI, VR, and robotics in government um, and and politics. So those were sort of the, you know, the, the parameters that, you know, I was operating under when I conceived the book. Sure. Well, and I mean, certainly some of these topics are incredibly relevant, um, maybe even more so than when you, when you published the book originally, just in the last... Um, you know, few weeks or a couple of months, I think the attention around technologies like, uh, like chat GPT, the kind of AI, um, uh, system online and, and the, the subsequent ones that have been announced or rolled out by everyone from, you know, Google, Microsoft, uh, Facebook and everybody else. Um, and how do you, I guess maybe let's ask a, a very time relevant question that given the enormous kind of um, clout that those systems bring to the conversation right now, how does that, how do you frame that through the lens of your book? And, and do you feel like there's a, it's what you've kind of not, uh, not prognosticated, but the, the, the path that you've charted, do you see that is already kind of rolling out in real time? Uh, yes, I mean there have been a lot of new developments, uh, technology developments that um, you know have been affecting government and politics. And, and by the way, one of the things I just wanted to note in terms of technology, um, you know, part of the object of the sort of technology issues brought up in the book was to you know transcend just the discussion of social media in politics, which is pretty well known, pretty well established, you know, for the last you know ten years. Um, at least. So, um, you know, I wanted to go beyond that. And the other thing I wanted to add to my previous description of the book um, and and the motivation for writing it was that um, I do cover a number of speculative government, you know, future government or emergent government forms like virtual nations, space stations, et cetera. And that's basically to sort of stimulate thinking about where uh, government will will, will go. And, And part of the whole uh, concept of the book is that government is because due to techno- technological issues and other issues, uh, societal issues, et cetera, uh, government is becoming more liquid and multifaceted. I mean, you have now, you know, e-government, you have, you know, e-citizenship, 
uh, and and e residency, you know, options in some governments. So, you know, that's just sort of the beginning of this whole process of government becoming more liquid, and that that's what you know kind of triggers a lot of these ideas, you know, for future government forms like virtual nations and space nations. Um, and so the idea is to basically expand people's thinking and concept of government and not just look at it as sort of a 19th century model. And, and uh, so some things are more realistic, some things are more likely to happen in the near future, and other things are much further out in the future. Um, but some of these things are starting to germinate. Um, you're talking about various kinds of AI software and how you know that can be increasingly applied to government and politics. Um, so it's happening, but, you know, I wouldn't kind of, you know, overblow it in terms of um, expecting that all of this is going to happen right away. I mean, with all new technologies, there are a lot of issues that take time to work out, uh, things like privacy issues and all, all sorts of other things. So it's, these things are not going to happen all at once or necessarily in, in the, you know, in the next three or five years. Yeah, I think I think that makes a lot of sense. And you know, um, last week I was um, I was at Cambridge for a conference about proportional representation. And as you know, as we're recording this in February of 2023, and you know, the buzz around what's going to happen in the presidential election in 2024 has certainly already started. And there were several folks that kind of added an asterisk to their. Um, to their forecasts of like, well, you know, we'll see what what groups like No Labels do. Like they've been talking about running a bipartisan presidential ticket in 2024, something that has the potential to not not necessarily shake up politics in America, but certainly open the door to a different type of conversation. And you know, while they are perhaps motivated to do that um, to you know reduce polarization and kind of bring some healing to a very divided country. Uh, I also think that, you know, as you said, we're starting to see this liquidity in political parties and maybe not in parties, but in voters, right? Where voters don't necessarily fit into one of, you know, of two large tanks, right? That exist. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, groups or individuals like, uh, like Lee Drutman and others that have really talked about the role of political parties in America specifically moving forward. Um, I know your book kind of talks about some of these outside groups or nonpartisan groups or cross-partisan groups. Um, from your perspective, your point of view, where do you see the role of political parties um, in our system moving forward? Right. So uh, just to kind of backtrack to your comments about no labels and other nonpartisan and cross-partisan organizations. So one of the central um, points in the book is that Organizations like No Labels, Third Way, especially centrist organizations, center-right, center-left organizations like like those in the U.S. and abroad, are playing a very significant role in uh, political innovation and driving change in government uh, by, you know, assembling together individuals from different parties, different, you know, major political parties. Uh, and I think the other aspect of this is that an organization like No Labels has done a tremendous amount of promotion so that that kind of, you know, their message about, you know, bringing people together and establishing, you know, dialogue and, and policies that can meet the needs of people from different, you know, political parties, different, you know, coming from different parts of the political spectrum, um, you know, has helped raise awareness of the possibilities for change. And, you know, and also some of these organizations have done quite a bit of outreach to, you know, citizens um, and the public through town halls and other means. And and that's also, you know, again, increased the visibility of these organizations and the potential for change. So, in other words, they're kind of encouraging and inspiring people to, you know, to to look and consider alternatives that might have a real chance of working. and, and that leads me to the second part of your question, which is, you know, where do political parties, and I'm assuming you're talking about third parties, alternative parties, et cetera, where do they come into play? And I, I think that there are some new parties like the Forward Party, which is a combination of different um, parties, 
formed by Republicans or former Republicans and Democrats, um, you know, that's kind of a model for, you know, um, a viable third party that, you know, has support from major political figures with a strong infrastructure um, and the ability to field candidates or to support candidates, whether they're Republican or Democrat or independent around the country. Um, so I think that those kinds of parties have more of a chance to succeed than some of the others that were just framed as, you know, like the Lincoln Project, just, you know, in opposition to a political figure like um, Donald Trump and, and not really advancing a broad enough agenda that appeals to a cross-section of people. So I think some, a party like the Forward Party has a lot more potential um, to attract support and to drive, you know, meaningful change. Yeah, it's interesting you you frame it that way. Last week at the conference that I attended, we we talked about um, in as as kind of like I don't know end posts to the conversation that a lot of a lot of electoral reform is aimed at preventing the tyranny of the majority and also the tyranny of the minority, right? Trying to hedge in between there. And I think in the conversation around political parties, we we try to avoid, I think a lot of electoral reform groups try to avoid or minimize the impact of the tyranny of the duopoly of the two major parties. And then I think the opposite pole from that is, well, in that case, how do we avoid the tyranny of the cult of personality of, you know, uh, someone that's very polarizing like Donald Trump um, coming out and, and operating under the guise of one of the, of a political party, but essentially operating as a, as an independent actor, um, that might not necessarily represent the, um, the the consensus of that party. And in fact, one of the presenters last week um, highlighted um, some examples from other countries in Europe, and I can't remember which country it was now. Um, I think it might have been Spain, um, where an, a, a system that has multiple viable parties, one of the parties change their name to reflect the name of their most popular individual candidate for president or prime minister. And that didn't fare well for them, but I, I just thought it was a very interesting example of this shift from, well, if parties aren't working for us, let's go all in behind a person and make remake the party literally in the name of that person um, and, and the potential for that to go well or, or to go poorly. Right, right. I guess the point that, that I'm making is that I, I think it's not enough to just start a party in opposition to political figure, and I think that's where the Lincoln Project founded. Founded. I suppose they succeeded in a certain way, but that's not really, you know, a long-term, um, you know, viable approach to, a, you know, creating a third party that attracts, you know, a whole range of people, and and that's why I think the forward party is a much better approach. Um, you know, the other thing I wanted to mention is that the book also discusses what I would describe as political networking organizations um, or, you know, political platforms um, not tied to any particular political party. And there are a number of them. One is the Alternative UK, um, which is kind of like, in a way, almost an offshoot of the Alternative um, Party that you know, ex has, exists in Denmark and that, you know, sparked a number of innovations using crowdsourcing and crowdfunding um, to attract uh, support. And, you know, I mean, just pioneering a lot of changes in government in, in Denmark. But anyway, the alternative in, in the UK uh, basically provides a lot of information about different political parties, you know, educates citizens about different choices and, you know, engages them in a discussion, um, again, across different political ideologies. And, you know, I think those organizations are also, you know, performing a valuable role um, in introducing, you know, sort of new opportunities and new options for people that are not satisfied with the, you know, choices that they have. Um, and, you know, there are other organizations of that sort. The Democracy Garage in, in Denmark is another example. So what I'm saying is that there are a lot of politi alternative political channels that are out there that many people are not familiar with, and and they're providing, I think, a very valuable service. Um, and and you know they're showing that there are other alternatives out there. There are positive developments happening, um, and 
you know, and that are appealing to a lot of people that are not aligned to a particular political party. Um, so I think that's part of the whole picture of, you know, driving innovation and change and providing hopeful alternatives to, you know, what we have with, you know, a lot of major parties around the world. Sure. Yeah. Well, I, I know your book doesn't go into great detail about some of the like specific electoral reforms that many of our members, you know, are, are, are champions of, but one that you do address, um, that I want to bring up but before we go is in chapter seven, it's about internet voting, right? And this, I think given the experience we've all had over the last few years since the pandemic and this recognition that we do almost everything else in our lives online from banking to, you know, trading stocks to filing taxes. Um, why don't we vote online? And I like the way that you kind of walk through the thought process that, that perhaps we should all go through about what are the real risks and rewards uh, or potential rewards about internet voting? Could you talk a little bit about that for our listeners? Uh, yes. By the way, one of the other uh, issues that I covered was the thing, uh, the issue of ranked choice voting. So that that was another issue that, you know, was discussed. Uh, but in any case, in terms of Internet voting, I mean, obviously, there have been a number of experiments. There are some countries that have used it to a greater extent, like Switzerland. Um, and there have been smaller scale projects done in the state of Utah and West Virginia uh, and places of that sort. There's potential for you know wider use of internet voting, but again, there are a lot of issues that have to be addressed, especially in terms of safety, um, security, and you know avoiding the possibility of fraud. Uh, so I don't I don't see that developing rapidly. Let's say in the next couple of years, I think eventually it will be you know worked out and it will become more widespread. But I don't I don't see that happening on a, on a larger scale you know, let's say in the next three years, uh, I think you'll see a lot more projects, a lot of efforts to test out new technologies for internet voting um, and to acclimate citizens to it. But I don't think it's something that's going to, you know, happen on, again, on a wide scale in the, in the near future. I think it'll take some time. Sure. Is, are there any countries now that are using it um, even on a small scale? Well, Switzerland has been one of the you know, pioneers of internet voting, and, and they have used it um, to a greater extent, uh, you know, at certain levels and for certain, you know, covering certain types of issues. But, um, and, and, you know, again, there, there are other countries that are trying it out, including the U.S., um, at least on a, on a smaller scale in states like Utah and West Virginia. Uh, but, again, it tends to be more localized or used to vote on certain issues, certain referenda, uh, and things of that sort. So that's kind of, you know, and, and then there's the issue of testing, you know, software. Uh, and one of the, one of the sort of newest forms of online voting is blockchain voting, which was again attempted in, in Utah. Uh, and so you'll see more pilots, more experiments with that. And I think as these, experiments, you know, succeed or build up more trust, then you'll see more of an expansion and, you know, in online voting. But I mean, I, I don't think you could, can expect like the presidential election um, I mean, to have voting in, you know, 50 states or a majority of states for the U.S. presidency in the next three years. That's not going to happen. It's going to take a longer time. Right. I mean, the American election system is incredibly uh, diverse, right? Most many states use different voting machines, even in county by county, right? They don't even have the same machine throughout the same state. Uh, and certainly across the country, there are, you know, some, uh, some larger vendors that, that sell voting machines to multiple states, but it is already very spread out. And so the idea of us coming around to a system that was somehow coalesced around a, a unified election system seems unlikely. And perhaps therein, exists some of the um the like a, a kind of built-in security mechanism that it is incredibly hard to hack all of these election systems at the same time uh, and so bad actors would have to focus on one or two where they feel like they can make the biggest difference um, but by shifting towards some kind of universal online voting system 
just by the nature of, of consolidating, we could potentially open the door to uh, a higher risk of, of some kind of um, interference there from, from bad actors. Right, right. And that's been the biggest stumbling block to the you know, advancement of, of online voting, um, especially on a larger and national scale. Um, the other issue has been sometimes, you know, questions and concerns about access to Internet voting, whether that will leave out a lot of people and disenfranchise, you know, people that don't have access to certain, you know, computer devices and things of that sort. I mean, over time, that's going to become probably less of an issue as more people gain access. But that's sort of a smaller stumbling block, um, you know, that that people have raised um, that have, you know, highlighted. But um, in any case, yeah, absolutely. Sure. It's interesting. Um, so I live in Oklahoma and we had an election yesterday for city councils and school boards. And while I was standing in line to get my ballots, it was one of those reminders of like, this system seems very antiquated um, where you have to check in and sign your name on a, on a you know, huge bound uh, voter roll book. And then, you know, a couple of different ballots and we use a, an optical scan. So you paper ballots and then you scan them in. And the whole process just seemed old, but then I went home to to have a, a, a Zoom meeting, and the host had a number of technical issues um, that you know we had to kind of switch hosts several times, and it was a even a system that all of us use or many of us use every day wasn't working, and it was a reminder to me of like, oh right, like maybe the current system is old, but it has some advantages, and certainly. The, the new system or the new technology is not ready yet for something as important, right, as, as Internet voting. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, uh, Michael, as we near the end of our time together today, is there, are there any other points from the book that you would like to highlight for our listeners to make sure that they, they kind of take away or that might encourage them to, to seek out your book? Well, I, I would just kind of uh, note again that the book discusses um, emergent uh, and future government forms like virtual nations and space nations, and I think it would be worth, you know, uh, taking a look at those parts of the book to just, you know, basically generate new ways of looking at government and and to consider different directions that government will go. Um, and when you're talking about virtual nations, I think one of the points that I make is that at a certain point, virtual nations, um, and there have been limited attempts at virtual nations, you know, will be like test beds for new, you know, political uh, and, and governmental forms. And they may be used, in fact, as satellites uh, by by actual physical governments, um, and or they may be, you know, they may combined in collectives, you know, having similar interests or similar um, missions. Uh, so, I mean, these are things to consider that, you know, government could go in a lot of different directions, and it will look very different in 10 to 20 years than it is now. Um, there'll be other forms out there. There'll be, you know, other opportunities for people to become involved in government and politics and and there are going to be different form, different opportunities for collaboration with government, um, which will be advanced by some of these, you know, new governmental forms. Yeah, that's right. As you know, I grew up watching Star Trek and Star Wars, and my thought when reading kind of the, those sections of the book were thinking ahead to, you know, whether it's twenty years or fifty years or hundred years from now, that we as humans could be entering into a new colonialism phase where we are establishing colonies on the moon or Mars or, you know, asteroids or outer planets or whatever. And that in doing that, we will at some point run into the same questions and um, issues we have now of, you know, is someone who is born in an American colony on another planet, are they an American? And if so, do they have voting rights? Do, you know, what are, what are some of the electoral consequences of, of becoming extraterrestrial, uh, an extraterrestrial race? And how does that play out on a, on a not just a geopolitical scale, but uh, you know, a, a, a interspace scale? Absolutely, there are a lot of issues to be dealt with in terms of the space nations, um, legal issues, sovereignty issues, and even biological issues. Uh, one of the people that I interviewed, an astrobiologist in the UK, pointed out the whole importance of having access to oxygen 
So people that control the ox- oxygen supply are basically in control, you know, politically and otherwise of, of you know, particular parts of, of space. Um, so that's another aspect that people don't consider when they think of space nations. So, you know, again, there are a lot of different um, issues, there are a lot of different challenges in, you know, creating new governments and, and, and new societies in outer space. Um, another person that I spoke to has this concept of, which relates to what you're talking about in terms of colonies in space, uh, the new Hanseatic league in space. And he take, he has a similar kind of perspective on, on that to, you know, your, your idea of colonies and, you know, sort of groupings of city states or, um, city nations in space. Um, I mean, these things can be applied, um, in space and, so it's interesting to kind of, you know, consider those possibilities. Yeah, no, thanks, Michael. I appreciate um, you being a guest today and for nudging us to think about things that are important, but maybe not, um, they're, well, they're closer than we think. I say they may not be urgent, but they are certainly closer than we think. Uh, and so I appreciate uh, people like you, uh, books like this. This is Reinventing Government Through Political Entrepreneurship and Exponential Innovation. My guest has been Michael Massioni. Uh, Michael, how can our listeners connect with you or find out more about you and your writings? Uh, well, I mean, they can reach me via email, um, and my email address is m m m a s c i o n i at aol dot com. I'm also on LinkedIn, uh, and the book is available through Amazon dot com and Smashwords. Super, Michael. Thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thanks for listening to How to Win Friends and Save the Republic. This podcast is a program of the National Association of Nonpartisan Reformers. For more information about our organization and how you can join, please visit our website at nonpartisanreformers.org. Thank you.